Hi, I'm Amanda Panda and you're watching the Online Prosperity Show. And today we've been talking about uh, how to get featured in the media and how to put your best foot forward with the media. Um, make sure you check it out. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. And today we've got the PR queen herself, Amanda. Amanda, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well, thank you. Very well, thanks. Now, Amanda has had extensive history um, in the PR department. First, she was a model and was working with um, herself up until she's won numerous awards that she's going to be telling us a little bit later. And then from then on, she went on and did a six-year stint in the Australian political scene. There, she was helping um, the politicians to actually um, put out their authentic side to the masses using PR. So this is why we have brought her in today so that she can help us, um, you know, authenticate ourselves just in case we do have an opportunity to be in front of the media, how to speak to them, what to say, and what a soundbite actually is. Now, Amanda, did I say any of that correctly? Yeah, you sound like a pro, actually. I think I've, I've taught you well in the two minutes I've spoken to you so far. <laughs> Great stuff. Thank that you. So fun. <laughs> <laughs> it is a life lesson that you've got to have. Now, Amanda, yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became a fan of the camera. Yeah, so I'm still learning to be a fan of the camera, but um, it's definitely helped with my past. I was in real estate for five years and dabbled in modeling on the side as a bit of a hobby. Uh, that's where I met most of my great friends that I have today. Um, I saw a competition at Kmart one day to win the best bum in Australia and I was a little bit out of shape at the time and I thought, well, you know, perhaps that would motivate me to like get fit and get in the gym and start eating better. So yeah, I went home and put, put everything into motion and was at the gym every night on the treadmill and yeah, little, about six months later, I was announced as being the um, Australian finalist and um, that took me all the way to Paris to compete internationally. Great stuff. Well, congratulations. You did win the award there. And then um, that was Best Bart in Australia and in 2008, wasn't it? Yes. So next year is my 10 year anniversary. So uh, I'm going to be in the gym a lot <laughs> between now and then because I really don't want to be, um, well, I still want to basically have a good butt 10 years later. I think that would be, I mean, for me, that would be a great story that it's still in shape. <laughs> Understandable. Yes, I, that, that, that's a really good story angle there. So in the midst of you, um, you know, getting through all this success, you also started a uh, clothing brand. Tell us a little bit about that. And did that also help, um, you know, get you in front of the media as a, as a business person? I have actually featured in the media since I started my work on Bathewear, which is my swimwear brand, which will be launching later on this year. Uh, I've been working on that since January. So I kind of I had this epiphany over the Christmas holidays. I was working full time in politics. I'd spent six years there and everyone kept saying to me, you need to go out on your own. You could, if anyone can run a business, it is you. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do it. And I, I did it. I resigned. I gave the world's longest resignation period of three months to make sure that I did the right thing by my employer at the time. And as of January, I started working on my swimwear collection. And um, as of March, I started freelancing uh, in public relations. I uh, so yeah. I understand. Busy. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for that. Now, obviously, in the time that you were working um, as an inmate in Canberra or in... in, um, in <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the going joke in there, inmates of Parliament House, because you have to actually see the building and all the offices that were in and all the long corridors and the white doors and the windows and the blinds. Like, it's, yeah, it's a bit of an inside joke, but yeah. We'll Correct. That. That. So as an inmate, um, could you tell us maybe what was a typical day uh, with all the media frenzy like for you? Okay. Um, well, most days would start very early. And um, if you were trying to keep your politician that you were looking after, so mine, for example, out of the media, you would ensure that they wouldn't go through the front doors of the morning because basically the whole media contingency from the press gallery would be waiting at the front door to do the morning door stops. 
So um, they could get in a little cave area underneath Parliament House to get into the office. They don't have to go through that way. So, um, so yeah, so if you see people going to the front of Parliament House and you see the media there, they're obviously there because they want to speak to them uh, and they can get asked a range of different questions. So, um, you know, a, a, better, a better course of being uh, erring on the side of caution is to not go that way every morning. Um, days are very long down there as well, from 7 a.m., probably most days finishing around 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Uh, yeah, but the majority of the work I did with the media would have been back here locally because it's more important for the politician to be in their local media where it counts because that's where their voters are. So we used to get told a lot not to worry too much about the national side of the media because the only people seeing the national stuff are the people in Canberra, but the people who are going to vote them into their seats are actually back home in their electorates. Understandable. So also as a business person, it is also advisable not to worry about, um, you know, widespread media that is not going to have your customers, but to dwell with where your serviceability areas um, could be. Is that, is that what you can also suggest um, for yeah. entrepreneurs? A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. So with all of my clients, we actually work on a targeted media contact list for their specific industry. Um, so I'll actually go away and prepare that and we'll actually only talk to those journalists and those reporters who actually report in those news rounds. Um, and that has a massive benefit because when you contact the masses as a PR person or as a business or anyone trying to manage your own PR and you just do the scattergun approach to everyone, it doesn't work. It gets picked up as spam. You have to genuinely know who the person is covering the round and have a personalized approach to contacting them. Understandable. So when you were helping the police, um, or the parliamentaries, you know, with yep. their media and they needed to be authentic in order for them to relate uh, to, to, you know, their, their electorate or the people that are electing them on. What sort of advice or tidbits would you give to an entrepreneur who's starting out and wants to appear as if, um, I mean, wants to appear closer to, to the people they're going to be demanding money off of? Well, for starters, I think entrepreneurs are in much better space um, than politicians because they're not scrutinized as heavily by the media. Politicians are actually very, very cautious in how they approach the media. Their scripts and their dialogue and what their, you know, their key messaging of what they are to say when they're in front of media is very different to how an entrepreneur would approach it. Um, I would say that most politicians are afraid to really be their true authentic self uh, in the media. And I think that entrepreneurs are at an advantage because they can be, because we're seeing this, you know, this massive shift now where it's so important to be you because your vibe attracts your tribe. And um, people buy into that. People can spot the phoniness and the fakiness. And that's, that's why a lot of people are disengaged and switched off on politicians because they feel as if uh, they're not real or trustworthy. So it's really important to be authentic. Yeah. Understandable. Now you've just um, gotten us into, you know, the segue of authenticity. In your own um, experience, being a model, working with politicians, how important is it to actually be authentic to your audience? I can honestly say that I've only just realised in the last few months how important that is. Because when I went from modeling to politics, I completely shut down everything modeling related, including massive fan pages where I had thousands of fans. This is before the Instagram days, so I could have potentially been set up to be a massive influencer if I had kept it going. Uh, shut it all down, you know, really went quite quiet and reserved and really kind of sheltered my personality and who I was as a person. I worked in the background in politics for a very long time and I don't feel like I was my true self. It's one of the main reasons why I decided to go into business for myself. And since going into business for myself, I'm learning from all of the, the mentors that I follow that it is so, so important, but it is very difficult if you've been in the professional world wearing this corporate mask where you feel like you send one version of you to work and one version comes back home and deals with your family and friends and your, your normal social life. Thank you so much for that. Now that you, we have figured out the, the press, we've figured out that you have to be authentic, what sort of things should people talk about to journalists in order for them um, you know, to actually get quoted or to have journalists find out what it is it exactly they actually do? Okay, so I would say it'd be a combination of, first of all, knowing your key messages 
And second of all, actually having something newsworthy. It's surprising how many people think that they're actually sitting on something that should be on the television. It should be in the press. It should be on the radio. It's news. Like it would be a great story because they see something else. And I think, oh, I could do that. But it really needs to have a news hook. Um, and a lot of people don't quite have it there. That's why it is really important sometimes to work with a professional that can actually sharpen that into a news hook. And for me, it's a little bit more advantageous for my for what I do is that I've actually worn the journalist hat as well. So I have actually done some journalism. So I understand what it's like to be in the newsroom. I see all of the story proposals coming in and all of those press releases coming in all the time. And a lot of them just don't make the grade or a lot of them are really good too, but there's just only so many journalists and so many stories that can get written. So a lot of good stories don't, don't make it. So I guess in order for a good story to make it, yes, you have to have a very good news angle. Some of those include Australian firsts or things that are happening for the first time in your community. They always work quite well. Um, breakthroughs, you know, really cool startup stories about businesses. There's a lot of people who are doing very cool, innovative things in, in small business. Um, particularly young entrepreneurs is another really good, good space. Um, but then I guess once you've put your news story together, you need to make sure that if you are going to get quoted in those little sound bites or in that, you know, the text that they pick up and copy and paste from your press release, that you're on message and you need to know what your message is before you start. Understandable. So obviously once you're in front of, you know, a journalist or some sort of interviewer or a media personality, you really got to know what your message is and your does it matter if you know your camera angles or does it matter what you wear once you are now, you know, being interviewed? Yeah, a hundred percent. And before I go on to that, I will just say under no circumstances ever say no comment or not answer the question. Um, the best thing to do is say, you know what, I'll get back to you on that. I don't have a response right now, but I will get back to you on that. Um, and to divert a question, probably one of the best things you can say is, uh, that's a really good question, but what I'd like to talk about is, so there are some ways to kind of steer the conversation for you more end too. Just because you're being asked a question, it doesn't mean you have to answer that particular question. So that's, that's one of the things I do with my clients in terms of the media coaching side of it. Uh, in terms of the presentation, the angles and, and what you wear and that sort of thing, um, I guess I'm lucky because I know what my good angles are and I love fashion. So I have quite the extensive wardrobe. But when it comes to other people, I don't think they're really thinking that far. Um, and there's not a lot of control to be honest, because at the end of the day, where you're positioned of like most of the time will come up to the, where the reporter wants to stand, where you are and where the cameraman has to stand with the best lighting and that sort of thing. So a lot of that stuff is kind of out of your control as is when they send photographers to do photos for news stories. Um, you often don't see the photo until it ends up in the paper. Understandable. Well, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty uh, profound there. So now that we've got our sound bites, we now know what to, um, you know, look, look like, or, you know, how to interact with the journalist. Is there any other advice that you might want to throw in there for just, just so that, you know, an entrepreneur goes in as media ready and they have something that, you know, um, is worth spreading to the mass media? Yeah, well, I think that's, that's the key. Like, make sure that it is something worth spreading. But I think my advice that I would like to leave for you to share with your um, audience would be that once you have appeared in the media, that's not the end of the story. That's when it's really important to repurpose that content, to put it on social media, to boost it, to sponsor it, to get it out there, to get more people seeing it, to repurpose it into a, a blog post. Because the credibility that you get once you've been fe featured in the media that's someone else tooting your horn. Advertising is you going, I'm great, look at me, it's fantastic. But when someone else actually speaks about you and you get published, that's huge. And you need to milk that for all it's worth and just continually put that out there. Understandable. So repurposing your content, no matter, is there like a time frame? Because then if you see somebody flogging a 1994 uh, news edition, would that, would that also still no. be... <laughs> yeah, look, the time frame would be do it straight after it's happened. Yes. Uh, but then there are a couple of other things that you can do. You can do a as seen in and use the logo of whatever media organization it was that you appeared in on your website so that you're adding that credibility long term. So as seen in and you can add it in there as like a bit of an archive story. Archive would be one way of doing it. And the other way would be doing a flashback. So, I mean, a year ago we were featured in, you know, you can keep using that as well. Or do you remember when we were in the news, you know, like, similar to sort of how people are sharing their memories on Facebook. You can, you can potentially be doing that as well down the track. 
Understandable. Now, Amanda, we might have, you know, entrepreneurs that are just sitting on the edge of their seat right now watching this video and they want to get a hold of you. What's the best way that people can find out what you're doing, your journey and how you can possibly help them? Yeah, so I have a website, which is www.wordsfromwilliams.com. Um, I'm quite the fan of Instagram, which is Amanda Williams underscore WFW. Uh, and I recently joined YouTube. So that is uh, a little bit of my baby in the making at the moment. <laughs> it's not quite there. I have two subscribers. <laughs> but yeah, my favorite platforms at the moment would be Instagram and um, yeah, emails, people contacting me from my website and let's just talk. And, you know, I love meeting people. I love hearing people's stories and I'm more than happy to spend 20 minutes to half an hour of my time just giving people advice, whether they choose to work with me or not. I'm, I'm just happy to, to show my expertise and, and, and listen to them. Understandable. Well, thank you so much for your time. And obviously viewers, if you're watching this, it is imperative that you basically need that third party validation from the media but you just don't get it you gotta have the right um you know news hook you also once you get in front of the media you also need to make sure that you know your message and you are going to make sure you present yourself well you know why because amanda says you have to continuously repurpose that content now you don't want to be repurposing content that was on national media or in local media that does not represent your brand in the right way. Now, thank you so much, Amanda, for your time, your expertise, and your story that you've shared on the Online Prosperity Show today. You're welcome. It's great to be here. <laughs> thank you so much. Great stuff. That was it. Good. How do you think we oh. went? Yeah, I think it's good. It flowed really well. I only had that one brain fart at the end. <laughs> <laughs>